was just a child when the stars fell from the skies. But I remember how they built a cannon to destroy them. And in turn how that cannon brought war upon us. War was an abstract idea, nothing more than a show on TV. As a child, I only saw it as something that happened in some faraway land. Until that final day of summer. One day while on my way to school, I looked up in the skies. A sound like distant thunder. In the blue skies far above me, contrails drew dizzying circles around in a crazy waltz. A battle in the beautiful skies far away. I could not tear my gaze away from them. swiftly into the sky. One fleeing plane fell out of the skies, spiraling and spewing orange flames to crash by the cape. The same cape where my family lived. Now they only live in my memories of days past. The victor circled around to confirm the kill. And on his craft, there was a large number 13 emblazoned in yellow. I will never forget this. The Allies retreated across the ocean before the onslaught of the enemy. Our little town in the heart of the mainland fell into deep isolation. The war seemed to unfold in the blink of an eye. I don't remember exactly when the forces from the west occupied my town. I was too busy scanning the skies day after day, waiting for Yellow 13 to reappear. Before I knew it, Everything changed. The language they taught us at school. Our friendly local sheriff disappeared and was replaced by foreign MPs. In the beginning, some people secretly tuned into broadcasts from North Point on their parabolic antennas. But as time passed, the broadcast no longer came in. Maybe the satellites were destroyed. All non-military computer networks were shut down. Gasoline was rationed to civilians. Though we lived in the 21st century, we were reduced to using crystal radios and horse-drawn carts. I moved in with my uncle in town, who used to be a taxi driver. Out of gasoline and out of work, my uncle did nothing but to drown himself in drink. I earned my keep by playing the harmonica in the town bar. The one thing I was good at. I'd play for sullen occupation soldiers in exchange for their charity and loose change. And used the money to support my uncle and myself. My uncle trash-talked the barkeep who catered to the enemy soldiers. But he never refused the money I brought home. As for myself, I had a crush on the barkeep's only daughter, who was a little older than me. Another day passed, yet still no sign of the fighter plane Yellow 13 in the skies above our town. One night, a spirited group made their way up the door, chased out the sullen army grunts, and commandeered the place. Even I knew who they were. The patch on their sleeve was the mark of the proud Air Force. A loud-mouthed, middle-aged man went around, announcing each pilot's results for the day and his running kill record. For those who exceeded five kills, a thorough toasting and soaking followed. 
I believe it was their custom to call a pilot an ace once he shot down five planes. After completing the day's review, the same guy, the squadron agent, went on to announce, And now, for our leader's results. Everyone turned around to look at the quiet man who sat alone, strumming a guitar. I found myself drawn to the music from his guitar. Our yellow 13 bagged three more today, bringing his new tally up to 64 kills. With a tentative smile, the man with the guitar turned to me and asked me to accompany him on my harmonica. I brought it up to my lips and I started a new song. I had finally found him. But by some fluke, it was my father's favorite song. The one he used to play at the end of each day. freeway under construction in a wheat field outside of town. When they started construction, I remember how the mayor bragged about it, even though it would completely bypass our town. The freeway became the occupation force's makeshift runway, and the unfinished tunnels their bunkers. This was their base. They were the elite flight squadron chosen to protect the cannon. Ironically, the same cannon that was created to shoot down the asteroids became a catalyst to the war. But when the Allied attacks no longer came, the squadron was assigned long-range missions that took them to distant battlefields. I thought of the words I would use to confront him and bided my time. Although I harbored these feelings within me, I could never get close to him. His wingman was always by his side. Despite having a gentle demeanor, I could tell that the wingman would never allow danger to get near Yellow 13, even on land. The pillar of their group, 13 exuded an air of invincibility. He always chose to fly a five-plane formation. He was a man who prided himself not on his kill record, but on his record of never losing a squadron member. It's difficult for me to describe just how good Yellow 13's flying was, but I witnessed it once from the ground. The lead plane with the five-plane formation should have turned the same arc with the same timing as the others, yet only his plane drew sharp contrails. His heart felt compassion towards the weaker enemies he downed. Someday, if an equal appeared and challenged the limits of his skills in a fight, he would bear no resentment about being shot down. He said this himself. And so as time passed, I found the goodness of a home in their company. Leaving them was no longer an option for me now. At some point I realized my uncle my would-be guardian, had vanished. Maybe the secret police dragged him off for some drunken comment he made. Maybe he chose to disappear. I didn't have anyone to turn to, so I found myself living as if I were a member of the Yellow Squadron. Everybody in town scorned the barkeep for doing business with the enemy. In reality, he and his family were members of the resistance. 
gathering up intelligence information from enemy customers. His daughter protected me. But that was only because of my tender age. The barkeep and his family were the real heroes, while I, on the other hand, found a haven among the enemy. It won't be long now. It won't be long till it begins, the barkeep's daughter confided to me. As a member of the resistance, she eagerly awaited the Allied counterattack on the mainland. What will happen to these people when the Allies come? I asked, to which she frowned. We'll run them out. This is our town. But I knew she didn't mean that from the bottom of her heart. Thirteen had captured her heart. I knew this from the way she shot jealous glances at his wingmen. As other pilots rotated out of Yellow Squadron, Yellow Four, Thirteen's wingman, always stuck by his side, even on land. The only female pilot in the squadron, she had Yellow Thirteen's absolute trust as his wingman. Yellow Thirteen seemed oblivious to all this, and instead reviewed the promising enemy pilot's performance from yesterday's skirmish. He's so close. If he manages to stay alive for just a while longer, that pilot could be a worthy opponent. But when there were no such enemies to look forward to, Thirteen's eyes were sad. Bombs were delivered to their base. This meant that an enemy who had to be fought by those means was close at hand. The resistance blew up the squadron's runway. Yellow Four suffered light shrapnel wounds. Though the runway could be fixed, the complete loss of reserve supplies was a heavy blow. Logistics support became infrequent following the Allied operations. I knew this because Yellow Squadron's crew chief belly ached about this all the time to me. I won't complain if I buy the farm while I'm airborne, but I can't stand being taken out while I'm grounded. Now I understand Thirteen's feelings. Reports of the Stonehenge air raid came in. Yellow Four made up with the others. With no bombs, her plane was light. But her plane was in bad shape. It needed an engine replacement badly.
box two. Mobius one, shot one down. Check Yellow 3. Yellow 13 here. Did anyone see Pearl get out? Mobius 1, the other aircraft are withdrawing. That's a confirmed kill on a yellow. It's a complete victory for the good guys. Though he lost four, 13 never openly showed his sorrow. But I found out. He was alone, quietly gazing at the handkerchief Yellow 4 left behind. When he felt my eyes upon him, he said, No matter what, she can't complain. She went up with her plane in disrepair. Pilots are responsible for their planes. He then went on and spoke of the time when they first met. He spoke of when she was just a girl, before he trained her, before she became a fighter pilot. His words weren't directed at me in particular. He was keeping a precious memory alive by speaking those words. The hint of perfume on her keepsake handkerchief. Yellow Squadron's pilot turnover ran high. The skilled ones went in to shore up other units while rookies with little airtime transferred in. Yellow 13 posted an allied paper faxed over by headquarters. It praised the pilot who destroyed Stonehenge. 13 said to everyone, Look, here's something worthy of praise. Even among the enemy there are men like this. Not all of them are despicable bastards who rob our wings through cowardly sabotage. I stared at the barkeep's daughter as she winced at those words. The Allies were coming to our town. As the Allies advanced, the retreating erosion forces from the east filled our town. The AA gun crew set up their positions atop the hospital and Yellow 13 smoldered with quiet anger over their tactics. Nights were long, with the town's mandatory blackouts. The barkeep's daughter tried to plant laser transmitters for detonating explosives. She got caught. It was Yellow 13. He knew she was responsible for planning the bomb on their runway as well. The face of the enemy whom he hated belonged to someone close to him. Get out of our town, you fascist pig. Those were the words from my mouth. I've never seen his face twist so painfully. Do you hate us that much? We couldn't shake or nod our heads in reply. It seemed like an eternity passed before he said go and released us. The next day there was no change in his attitude. As usual, he made his requests to the squadron crew chief. The poor fuel quality is affecting thrust. As soon as the Allied forces drew near, the resistance would end the blackouts over the city. OB-1, 
Mobius One shot down a target. Locked on. Target down. Target destroyed by Mobius One. Radar lock. Mobius-1 shot down the five aircraft that appeared. Air superiority is ours. You made it through alive, Mobius-1. Singing. The town was free at last. During the night raids, the AA gunners had strafed the town in an attempt to shoot down low flying aircraft. The town militia now rounded up these gunners. They retreated as well and now their quarters stood empty. After what seemed like a long absence, Allied aircraft soared overhead. I wondered if the fateful enemy ace, the one that Yellow 13 longed to meet, was on the What would happen if they ever came face to face? I fell in with the routed erosions and followed after the squadron. Yellow 13's body vanished into the blue skies, never to return to Earth. Only a single handkerchief fluttered down from the sky where he disappeared. The faint scent of perfume. The barkeep's daughter and I had followed the squadron this far. Each of us had our own thoughts as we buried that handkerchief. It no longer mattered to me whether that was 13 or 4's grave. Their memories blurred together as one and left the realm of reality like a dream. The terms of surrender were accepted that day and the war was over. A group of young Erujian officers have taken over Megalith, the superweapon that was under development. Megalith is a rocket launch facility that can shoot down asteroid fragments in orbit. The only way to destroy this highly dangerous and fortified facility is to hit it from the inside. Follow the missile port grooves to find the three generators deep within the facility. Destroy the generators to access the central heat vent. Once inside, destroy the giant missile in the central silo. An infiltration unit will secure your escape route. Their plan calls for waiting until the generators are offline, and then taking over the sub-control room once the blackout hits. Enter this rat's nest with full confidence that the unit will get you out again. It's highly likely that this will be your final mission. Remember, we need heroes after the war too. Sky Eye here. All Mobius aircraft report in. Mobius 2 on standby. Mobius 3 through 7 on standby. Mobius 8 on standby. Preparations are complete, ready for battle. All aircraft follow Mobius 1. Splash one, splash two. 
Splash One.
The once familiar scent of burning jet fuel has long since faded away. What was once Yellow Squadron's runway is now just a local highway again. I write this letter to you now. I know it must have brought him unexpected joy to have an opponent like you at the end of that meaningless war. At least that's what I want to believe. Only you, the pilot who shot him down, can confirm this. And so, I write to you.